As someone with a British accent, I am contractually obliged to bring up what peculiar weather we're having today, at least once per conversation. Today, I've come to the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina to find out how weather prediction actually works. I'm going to begin today by introducing you to my friend and personal lawyer, Dart, the bloodsucking leech. Leeches don't do too well during flooding, so have evolved the ability to detect the small decrease in atmospheric pressure, indicating an oncoming storm. When storms approach, they will climb up and out of the water in order to seek shelter. Realizing their weather detecting capabilities and with medical leeches in ready supply, in 1850, Dr. George Murrayweather designed and built one of these, a leech-powered tempest prognosticator. The leech would reside within a couple of centimeters of water at the bottom of a glass jar. When storms approached, it would then climb upwards, activating a whalebone tripwire, pulling on a cord and ringing a spherical bell. After a lengthy study of his leech buddies, Merriweather determined a few things. Occasionally, one of the leeches would be having a bad day, lazing around at the bottom of its container and unable to predict the weather. Leeches enjoyed a communal work environment, but at the same time, would also occasionally eat each other. In response, Merriweather modified the prognosticator to house 12 leeches in separate glass jars. They could see each other, but also wouldn't eat each other. This meant that each could individually predict the weather. The more frequently the leech bell chimed, the more certain Merriweather could be of an oncoming storm. The thing did work and was able to predict storms some three days in advance. In fact, it impressed the British government so much that it was briefly considered for adoption by the Royal Navy. However, that honor eventually went to the much more pretty, although also entirely useless, Fitzroy Stormglass. As good as leeches are at predicting storms, their predictions understandably lack some detail. For that, we would need something a bit more scientific and a lot more precise. In order to predict the future, we first need to really understand the present. And the way we do that is with weather stations. There are hundreds of thousands of these scattered across the world. This one at the Blue Hill Observatory is one of America's oldest, constructed back in 1885. This massive, spidery looking piece of equipment is actually just a regular old rain gauge. Like the ones which you may have in your garden, you record the amount of rain that falls in a set period of time, empty out the bucket, and then reset it. The only difference is that these metal sheets prevent wind from blowing in rain from the side and interfering with the measurement. Modern automated stations switch out this cylinder for a seesaw, upon which is mounted a miniature bucket and magnetic counterweight. Rain fills the bucket, the seesaw tips, and a magnetic reed switch increments the counter. The most readily recognizable piece of weather monitoring equipment on both the old and new systems has got to be that involved with the wind. This wind vane points in the direction of the oncoming breeze, while the cup-based anemometer measures its velocity. We're able to record how fast it spins or in what direction we're pointing by using a series of magnets and magnetometers. To help keep them protected from the elements, our remaining sensors are held within these corrugated boxes, allowing air to flow through without the precipitation. While the outsides may look similar, the insides are nothing alike. As expected, we use a bunch of capacitors and resistors in order to report humidity. But for the old school example, we use actual human hair which expands or contracts as humidity changes. Regardless of where, when, or how this collection is done, eventually our data streams make it to central repositories, like the World Data Center for Meteorology in Asheville. Here we cross the streams, allowing us to do some pretty cool analysis. If you've ever seen the weather report, then you're probably familiar with one of these. It's called a synoptic chart. It works by combining data from lots of different weather stations, showing features such as pressure, temperature, humidity, and rainfall, which are of interest when understanding the weather. In the past, the way that we would predict weather is by looking at the current synoptic chart 
and comparing it to a database containing all the synoptic charts generated in the past. When we found one that looked pretty similar to the current version, then we'd look forward in that history's future, which is still our past, and therefore predict what the future of our future is actually going to look like. Since weather patterns will move and morph over huge tracks of land, this method is only reliable for about a day or so into the future. However, its comparative success proved that there was at least some underlying logic to the weather. In 1904, Norwegian physicist Wilhelm Jägnes formulated a set of seven equations, which could be used to mathematically model the climate. He suggested splitting the world into a grid of one degree by one degree segments, within which atmospheric properties were considered homogeneous. Starting with some initial conditions, you would then integrate each of these equations over a time step of an hour, and then feed the results of each segment into its immediate neighbours. To find out what the weather is going to be this time next week, all you need to do is solve for these 76,204,800 equations without making a single mathematical error. Good luck. The blueprint for computer-based weather modelling came from British mathematician Lewis Fry Richardson in his seminal work, Weather Prediction by Numerical Method. However, back in 1922, his idea for computer was actually 64,000 mathematicians who would manually crank out the required calculation. With this in mind, Lewis designed a spherical auditorium, where each mathematician was situated to represent the real-world coordinates of one of the grid cells, and would be responsible for all the calculations of that cell. A conductor wielding different coloured torches would then tell individual mathematicians to speed up or slow down, in order to keep the entire global calculation in sync. From a practical standpoint, this whole thing is ridiculous. But once silicon-based computers with serious number crunching power came along, it was a simple matter to convert these suggestions into actual usable code. Today we use a mix of low-resolution global models and high-resolution local ones, adding in an extra dimension of altitude in order to make things a bit more realistic. Physics-based equations, known as parametrizations, link larger scale results of the grid to smaller scale local phenomena. Pioneered by Dr. Joanne Simpson in the 1960s, these equations for cloud formation allow us to consider effects which would otherwise be missed, improving both the accuracy and usefulness of our predictions. Our final obstacle brings us back to bugs. Not leeches this time, but butterflies. The story goes that in 1961, American meteorologist Edward Lorenz was rerunning a simulation on his computer. Going out to grab a coffee, Upon his return, he found some rather interesting results. The outputs from his two simulations started identical, but after about a week of simulation time, the two started to differ. At first, just by a trailing decimal point, but over more and more time, they were completely unrecognisable. At first, Edward panicked, thinking that he'd fried his computer during the second simulation. Looking in more detail, however, he saw the real problem was with his inputs. In the first round, he used a humidity value of 0.506127, but in the second, he rounded it off to 0.506, thinking nothing of it. However, as it turns out, the tiny difference in initial conditions eventually grew to dominate the solution. This chaotic phenomena has since been dubbed the butterfly effect, with the idea being that a flap of a butterfly swing in Brazil could eventually set off a tornado in Texas. Predicting the weather as a chaotic system is mathematically impossible. You might as well go right back to leeches. Which is actually sort of what we do today. Like how Meriwether used a council of 12 in order to predict oncoming storms, even if one or two of his leeches were having a bad day, today we use ensemble forecasting. Essentially, we run up to 50 simultaneous simulations with slightly different input conditions. We then take the average of their results in order to produce a forecast. If in one simulation we have 100% of the area is going to be covered in rain, and in the other 0%, then together we get a 50% chance of rain. On the other hand, if both simulations say 50% rain cover, then together they will still give this value of 50% chance of rain, even though the day that we experience will be very different. From a council of leeches, to a dome of mathematicians, and an ensemble of simulations, 
predicting the weather can be almost as extreme as the weather itself. But what about rather than just anticipating what's to come, instead we could control it. Dial up a downpour or clear the skies with a wave of your hand. It's going to be some extreme engineering, but we'll need to wait for another episode. Until then, this has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier. Keep looking up.